What's up guys, Eric here. Welcome to Rant and Review. In this video, we're gonna be talking about Superman and Lois, season one, episode three, titled The Perks of Not Being a Wallflower. So careful for spoilers if you're not caught up with Superman and Lois this season. You've been warned, let's get into it. So before we dive into my notes and all my thoughts on individual stuff from this episode, I just wanna put this out there. To me, this week's episode of Superman and Lois felt the most CW-ish, if that makes sense. CW-ish, it felt like it was in that spectrum of CW shows. That's not necessarily a bad thing. And there is a reason why, and that's because this week's episode primarily focused on the kids. It was very much revolving around those characters and everyone else was sort of hovering. Lois had a story and yeah, Clark did some stuff, but it was primarily just about the kids this week. And we didn't dive too deep into much else outside of the lowest stuff. We will get to that. So, you know, visuals, great. I think everything else was still really good. Um, obviously still that high quality, you know, uh, the VFX and things like that. All of that was there. But again, very CW-like because of the context of the episode. So knowing that and understanding that, I'm curious to know what you guys think. Do you think this felt more CW than the previous two episodes? Or is it just me that noticed that? I Just let me know in the comments because I really want to know. All right, so um, we start out this episode with the family all together, painting the house, they're having fun, and of course, Clark has to rush away to be Superman and save the day across the world, anywhere in the world that he hears anything going on. The kids aren't aware of this, and he doesn't hide the fact that he has to run away. They aren't aware that he can hear everything, and that's part of like the conversation we have in the episode where he tells the kids you know, he's able to hone in on distress signals and he's trained for years to figure this out. And so that brings into question whether or not he like eavesdrops on people and they all kind of have a laugh about it. And it plays a part with the kids in a moment, but I want to talk a bit about the bridge scene because I thought it looked absolutely great. It wasn't perfect. It wasn't as good as like the first two episodes. I think there was some stuff in it that did feel a bit like unfinished in the CGI. I always call out unfinished CGI. Just a couple of parts of the scene felt that way. But I did love the scene because it showed Superman smiling and waving at a guy in a fishing boat. And that felt classic to me. That felt like a classic Superman moment. And again, it's what I love about this show. Like, we still have the more mature elements, but Superman feels like Superman to me. And we've been missing that for a while in a lot of the iterations. And there are moments of it here and there, but in this show, I just feel like they've nailed that that feel for Superman. And so we get that in the starting scene with the bridge and, and all that. And again, special effects were okay. Wasn't great here. Much better later in the episode when we get to a fight scene. I'll talk about that when we get there. But uh, yeah, what a great way to start off the show. So the boys are still, they're they're going to high school, they're dealing with being there and all the bullying and all this stuff and everything. And we have one of the one of the uh, bullies, I can't remember which one it was, Sarah's boyfriend, I don't remember his name, bad with names as always. Sarah's boyfriend, he's on the football team and all of his friends are still bullying Jordan and they're still trying to make him feel bad for something that happened. And I mean, this is typical. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that you're gonna get on the CW. This is a storyline that could be in any of the CW shows. So that's why it felt CW to me. And that's kind of the narrative throughout the episode with other stuff that happens. So it's like, I just feel this way about it. Anyway, well, Clark shows up at school during fifth period and they're like, he's like, oh, you know, I just came by to see the school and, you know, trying to play the cool dad or whatever. But they knew that that wasn't real. And so this swings into a thing about him eavesdropping on them and whether or not they can trust him because of this. And he's just not, he is struggling as a dad here. He is struggling in this role as a father. And he's trying so hard, but he's just dropping the ball. And, you know, it's, it just goes to show that you've got this, this uh, Superman thing with him where he's like this character in the world that everybody looks at and he's the pinnacle of like this hero and then you have him as a dad where he's just not doing great and it shows that there are things that he's not perfect at so it's this weird like dichotomy thing and I, I like it I really enjoy it so we see that happening he has to apologize to the kids because he reminisces about how this happened with him and Lois and I, th I thought all this was great. This was wonderful. But the thing with the kids going on is that the we saw some photos. I saw them the other day, some set photos of both of them in football jerseys. And I thought, well, I wonder what's going on here. We find out Jordan wants to try out for the football team to prove a point. And Jonathan isn't really thrilled about it. And you can tell. And I thought this is going to be drama between the brothers because, you know, they're setting up this whole thing where Jonathan's thing was football and Jordan didn't really care about football. And so... Having the two of them both on the team together was, you know, especially with Jordan, who's going to just excel at this because of his powers emerging 
earlier than his brothers because I still have a feeling his brother has powers as well. I think we're going to get to that. And I think having them on the football team together is a great way to set that up. So I think this is, again, just goes into my theory. If you haven't seen it yet, I made a theory video. Click up in the corner here and go check it out. A theory on how the boys' powers work. And I think that this is going to set that up. But anyway, so Jordan's on the team. Obviously, he's using his powers and he's impressing everyone. And Jonathan is feeling sort of defeated by all this. And ultimately, after hiding it from his dad, his dad finds out eventually... They decide, Jonathan and Clark, that it's good for Jordan to be on the football team because it's something that he can do to take him out of this, like, mopey, you know, introverted world that he's been in. So they decide it's a good thing. They want him to keep his powers in check and everything. And so he uh, roughs up the bully a bit on the field, but then apologizes and kind of, you know, it's like water under the bridge, or at least maybe it will be. We'll see what happens. And so he's going to continue to be on the football team. Now, there is questions about how he was capable of knowing the limits of his powers Yes, absolutely, that should be brought into question. And I think that is something that we have to sort of keep on the back burner of our minds on whether or not they're going to address that. Because it is a bit hard to believe that he is capable of holding back when he doesn't even know the full extent of his powers. And it seems like he's got powers roughly when he wants them because being around his brother I guess that shows that he's capable of just using his powers when he wants. I think Jonathan's powers will emerge eventually. And so there's that. We had this stuff with Lana and Sarah and their family drama, which also tied into the boys. So uh, Lana is basically keeping tabs on Sarah. Sarah's going to therapy and there's a lot of things happening with her and she's just tired of her mother hovering over her. This again was just in that CW territory for me. So I'm like halfway tuning out of it. It just wasn't really that interesting to me but I will say the scene where she quit the team she quit cheerleading and they were at the restaurant together it was her and the brothers and her mom shows up and she's like asking her what's wrong with her and she just unloads on her mom like she starts like dropping all of these bombs like dad's sleeping on the couch and you can't go to sleep without taking a pill and all this other stuff like just all of this drama about the family unloading in this little diner where like all these people are there eating and it's just I don't know. I kind of giggled at that because it was so awkward. I was like, oh my gosh, like I would, I would, if I was her mom, if I was Lana, I would have walked out of there. I would not have stayed to put up with that because that was a bit much, Uh, but they're dealing with that drama and you know, it looks like Sarah is not going to be with her boyfriend. And so that sets up a possibility for a love interest thing with Jordan. So all that stuff is uninteresting to me. We'll talk about it obviously each week, but I can't promise you that I'm going to be like invested in that because relationship stuff as you know not the thing that i watch the shows for so if you have any thoughts and opinions on this please leave it in the comments below all right uh i was going to talk a bit more about clark i have it in my notes here because i do feel like this episode he kind of played a back seat in terms of his character he he did have moments with the boys and he was dealing with being a father and we get that bridge scene at the beginning and then we get a scene with him and lois later on but clark's character I don't feel like he was the focus of the episode. So for me this week, I think he was almost the third wheel story. Like it was like the brothers and then we had the stuff with Lois and then the Clark stuff was kind of a bit lower on the pole, I guess, suppose. Um, Anyway, thought it was a great, great uh, storyline anyway and enjoy seeing the stuff with him growing as a parent. And I think that's kind of cool. Let's talk about the Lois Lane stuff. So she's still working at Smallville Gazette. Clearly her story with Morgan Edge has uh, ruffled some feathers. And, you know, she wants to continue to do that, but that's not the kind of story that you get in in a paper like that. So every story can't be a story like that. The editor, um, what is her name? Chrissy Beppo. I think it's Chrissy, right? Correct me if I'm wrong, but I know it's Beppo. His last name, Beppo Beppo. She tells her like, look, you're going to have to write stories about other stuff. You can't, not every story can be this hard hitting journalistic editorial thing, like investigative piece. Uh, But as they're doing that, this woman, Sharon Powell, I believe was her name, shows up with a story about her son and his dealings with Morgan edge. And she has like a voicemail that he left her before he just kind of vanished where it sounds like he's, he's like, I want to leave you this voicemail because if anything happens to me, I want you to know, I love you, blah, blah, blah. So this seems like something that kind of gets Lois excited. And so Lois wants to pursue this. And Chrissy is like, you know, this is just all hearsay. There's nothing there that targets Morgan edge. And we can't put out a piece like that, you know, because of this. And then, you know, they find out that Lois's car has been shot on fire. It's uh, up in flames now. I don't know if it was shot up or if it was just lit or whatever, but it was on fire outside. And we know there was a guy kind of tailing her earlier with a camera. And I don't know if it's the same guy that we meet later on uh, when she goes a- after information from Mrs. Powell. I don't know. I Now that I'm thinking about it, I don't know if it's the same person. It probably was, but I'm not totally sure. Anyway. 
So sets fire to her car to send her a message. But of course, it's Lois. Lois isn't going to listen. So she decides she's going to pursue this even further. So she wants to go get more information. Uh, she goes to meet Mrs. Powell at this motel. And there's a guy there who has trashed the room. And she doesn't see Mrs. Powell there. And he comes out and he's threatening Lois. And she pushes the button on the receiver that signals Superman to come. And he immediately comes to save Lois. And it seems like he's there and he's doing fine. And he's able to handle this guy or whatever. And then the guy starts just unloading on on Superman. Like he's he's able to stop his punches. He is just laying into Superman. This scene, like, okay, so the special effects in that first scene, I said, weren't that great. This scene, though, no problem. The fighting in the scene was amazing. This is the kind of stuff from a Kryptonian character that I want to see on the small screen. One of my biggest complaints about Supergirl and, and Krypton and any of these other shows is that there's a level of intensity that you need from a Kryptonian character when they're fighting. And there's a special effect way you can do it to make it work. But I've always been concerned that on TV, it doesn't translate as well. Now, in the Man of Steel movie, if you go back to that movie and you watch the fighting there that Superman does, especially against uh, Zod and, and all of his minions, that looks like the way a Kryptonian would fight. Like, that's literally my favorite style of Superman fighting is from Man of Steel. I love that. This felt like a nod to that, but not exactly the same. And in a TV world. So I loved it. So he's fighting this character. I don't know if we got his name in the episode, but he's listed as Subject 11. Now, in the comics, there's a Subject 17, and I'm familiar with that character, but he looked like a weird, almost like doomsday deformed creature, and he was part of like a Soviet program or whatever and he was called subject 17 now this is subject 11 i i don't know everything about that story i just remember seeing that character in an issue that i read a while back i have to do some more digging to see if they're going to go into that storyline but this character is pretty powerful and um you think this is going to be a character we're going to be dealing with for a while but he's literally a villain of the week because after superman has this fight with him and manages to beat him you see him driving down the road and he's talking to Someone on the other end, I'm assuming connection to Morgan Edge, I'm going to gonna assume, um, or maybe maybe Luther, maybe it's a Luther thing, not totally sure, but he's talking to somebody on the other end of the phone, because we didn't get any Luther stuff this week, and he says, Lar, I think he said Lara's going to handle it, and then this woman shows up with heat vision and just kills this guy, Subject 11. So not totally sure who this character is, I'm going to do some digging, because as always, I do these reviews right after the episodes. So I'm going to do some digging and find out more about her because I'm trying not to get too spoiled on Superman and Lois. I'm doing very little in terms of like researching anything before the episodes come out. So for me, I kind of just want to be somewhat surprised. And then that way I'll have more to talk about during the after party every Wednesday at six o'clock um, with you guys. So that's kind of what I'm looking forward to. So what did you think of all of that? Did you think it was good? Did you think it was bad? I'm very, very excited about the direction of the series right now. This episode to me probably storyline wise was the weakest because it felt the most like a typical paint by numbers CW like high school drama series in most of the episode. But what elevated it was obviously the stuff with Lois and then the fight scene and stuff. I thought all of those were pretty good. So for me, again, the weakest episode of the season, but it's only episode three and it wasn't bad. It wasn't a bad episode. So you guys have to let me know down in the comments what you thought about this. Is there anything that I missed in this episode that you wanted me to talk about? I probably did because I made these notes very quickly. So if there's anything you want me to talk about, you can let me know. If you have any theories, thoughts, and opinions, any info on these big bads or these villains of the week that you want to talk about, all of that's in the comment section below for you guys to talk about. And I can't wait to go through and read and hear from each and every one of you. As far as scores go, I would probably score this episode like a 7.5 out of 10. 7.5 out of 10. I think that it was kind of weak compared to the other episodes. We're going to see where it goes. I still have high hopes for it. It still had the high quality uh, visuals. I mean, so it looks like they didn't, you know, skimp out on that. There was some concern for people whether or not these visuals were going to hold up every single week. And I think this episode proved that they will. So there was that. So I'm pretty excited. Anyway, that's pretty much it, guys. If you're brand new to my channel, hit the subscribe button and become part of the Eric verse. Hit the join button to become part of Team Eric and get some exclusive stuff like emojis, badges, 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 emojis and badges. Maybe we'll create badges. I don't know. For the live streams, uh, you also get some early access and exclusive content. And there's two tiers there. Pick the one that works for you and help support the channel in another way. Leave a like and definitely leave a comment down below. That's it. 
Superman and Lois, Season 1, Episode 3. Give me your thoughts down below. I'll catch you guys in the next video. See you then.